If you're uh, visiting, we're studying 1 Corinthians chapter 12 this morning as we go through the book of Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 1 through 31, that's our text. If you'd open there or navigate on your device, please. The topic, God gave the church the gift of the Holy Spirit, who then gives each member a gift or gifts in order to manifest himself to benefit everyone. The title of our message, The Gift Who Keeps On Giving. Let's pray. Father, thank you for bringing us to this point in the morning where your word is open before us and we are hungry to hear it and to receive what you have to say. Uh, As we talk about you, Holy Spirit, this morning, uh, we're reminded that you are our teacher. That's what Jesus said, that you would come and be our teacher, come alongside and comfort us, um, that you would bring us closer to Jesus. We pray that all those things would happen this morning. We want to understand this text in its context and see how it speaks to us today. We thank you and praise you. We do it in Jesus' name. And those who agreed said, amen. In the Superman Origins movies I've seen, a young Clark Kent was always frustrated that he couldn't participate in normal activities like playing football, imagine that, on account of his powers. As he matured, he came to understand that his powers were not for himself, they were for the benefit of others. On the day he ascended to heaven, Jesus promised his followers then and now, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Not long after that, we read, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. After being filled with the Holy Spirit, a believer is described as being given a gift or gifts by the Holy Spirit. Earlier in this letter, Paul had said, you come short in no gift. They had gifts in abundance, but they were abusing their gifts in the public assembly. Instead of benefiting others, they were calling attention to themselves. It had gotten so out of order that the apostle will say to them regarding visitors to their services in chapter 14, Will they not say that you are out of your mind? That's great, right? You go to church and then you leave and somebody says, hey, how was church? All those people are crazy. I'm never going back there again. His correction begins in chapter 12 and extends through chapter 14. I'll organize my comments around two points. Number one, God the Holy Spirit gives you manifestations to benefit others. And number two, God the Holy Spirit sets you as a member to benefit others. Let's take a look at manifestations in verses 1 through 11. You can read 1 Corinthians about an hour. Its original recipients undoubtedly heard it read all at once. They understood that what we're calling chapters 12, 13, and 14 were one subject. And that subject is the correct function of the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the public assembly. Uh, Time doesn't permit us to study all of them together, but we'll be borrowing some stuff that Paul doesn't say here uh, and bringing it to bear because this is one subject. In chapter 12, we are introduced to the gifts of the Holy Spirit as being supernatural manifestations of his power and presence that are given to believers to the benefit of others. Then in chapter 13, that's the oft-quoted treatise on love being the controlling influence in all of our lives including any use of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Then chapter 14, Paul gives point-by-point instruction about how to utilize gifts decently and in order to benefit others. And so verse 1, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. In this case, ignorant means ignoring. As I've told you before, Paul had been with them some 18 months when he founded the church. During that time, he must have modeled for them the correct way to minister to one another using the gifts. They were ignoring that example in favor of what they considered to be more spiritual. They felt that what they were moving towards and had discovered was more spiritual than what Paul had left them. And then verse 2, you know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. 
The Gentile believers at Corinth had been saved out of religions in which wild spiritual experiences were considered normal. They would be led, they'd say, to do and say things without any restraint or order. The more out of control you were, the more spiritual it was deemed. And so that's what they were used to. They got saved. Paul modeled for them the proper expression of the power of the Holy Spirit, not these dumb idol spirits. And now they were gravitating more towards the wild, more towards the crazy, because for some reason that seemed more spiritual to them. Verse three, therefore I make known to you, no one speaking by the spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of different ways to approach this verse, but in the context of this argument, it is a reminder that any manifestation that is attributed to the Holy Spirit will be consistent with his mission to call attention to and bring glory to Jesus. And I think it's a subtle way of introducing an idea Paul develops more as we go forward, that it is necessary to test all so-called manifestations of the Holy Spirit according to the Bible or what we might call orthodoxy. And this, believe it or not, is shunned by many people. They feel that if you pause to, let's say somebody gets up in church and, and utters a prophecy, uh, it wouldn't be beyond the realm of possibility that even here right now on a Sunday morning like this, somebody would just get up on their own and say, thus says the Lord and prophesy. Well, what Paul would say is that, well, okay, that's out of order, but let's take a look at that. Let's listen to what was said. Does that line up with the Bible? And a lot of people would say, well, wait a minute, God gave a prophecy. Well, who, who cares if it lines up with the Bible almost, you know? And uh, that's what Paul's saying. He say, hey, people can say that the Lord is a curse, but people can say that he is the Lord. That means we need to judge between the two and, and figure out who really has the spirit of God and if God is really speaking. And so this is a move in that direction. Verse four, five, and six, there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. We worship one God who has revealed himself in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is from the Godhead that gifts originate. It is to the Lord that they should bring attention and glory, never to ourselves. He says there are a variety of gifts, Paul mentions nine in verses eight and nine. Then in chapter 12, in verse 28, he adds three more. There are more gifts listed in Romans chapter 12, in Ephesians chapter four, and in 1 Peter chapter four. And I, with a lot of other commentators, would say those gifts are, pro or lists rather, are probably not meant to be exhaustive. We don't wanna go around just inventing our own gifts of the spirit but I don't think there's any one exhaustive list. Some people say there's nine gifts of the Spirit to match the nine fruits of the Spirit. Others say there's as many as 26 gifts that are listed in the Bible. Uh, we're not interested in a number, uh, we're interested in their use. Then he says there are a variety of ministries. The New International Version translates the word ministries as service. We each serve the Lord in different ways depending on how he has gifted us. Then there are a variety of activities. This means that people with the same gift exercise it differently according to their own uh, personality, as it were. Verse seven, but the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. When you exercise a spiritual gift, it is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit who indwells you and it is intended to benefit others put the emphasis on others, or as uh, it's been said before, the emphasis on others. No? Too much for you? 1 Corinthians 12, 8, for to one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. I think the best way to understand the gifts listed here and elsewhere is always to see them being manifested in the ministry of Jesus or his disciples. So rather than just give a definition, you can actually see them in action as it were. And, and just as a, uh, a foundational point, Jesus, when he was on the earth, was fully God and he was fully man in a way that we couldn't possibly understand. Uh, it's just the, 
that's the way it is. He was fully God and fully man. He didn't quit being God to become man and then become God again. Fully God, fully man. But he set aside what we call the prerogatives of his deity in order to live as a spirit-filled man. Now, why am I telling you this? Because we're going to get into some things that Jesus did. And a lot of times people say, oh, well, that was easy for Jesus because he was God. Well, yes, he was God, but he was not drawing from his own God powers. He was living as a person in submission to the Father, just like you and I. He was modeling the Christian life, as it were. And so we see Jesus as a spirit-filled believer, uh, and, and that helps us to understand what these gifts are like. So first of all, we'll take the gifts in order that Paul listed them. We know that Jesus was often given the word of wisdom. One that comes to mind is when he was seemingly cornered by being asked if it was lawful to pay taxes to Caesar. If he said yes, one group would be against him. If he said no, the other group would be against him. It was an insurmountable dilemma. It was a lose-lose situation. So he asked for a coin and he said, whose inscription is on it? And they said, Caesar's. And Jesus uttered this word, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. It was an unassailable word of wisdom that could only come directly from God. As Stan Lee would say, enough said. That's all you needed. And so maybe you've had that experience where you've all of a sudden you've just felt like, hey, this is the answer. And what you've said just silenced everyone because it was full of the wisdom of heaven. And Jesus was always doing that. That's the word of wisdom. The word of knowledge came to Jesus while talking to the woman at the well. After telling the Lord she had no husband, he replied, you have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. How did the Lord know that? Again, it wasn't because he was God. It was because his father gave him a word of knowledge, knowledge he couldn't have known otherwise that was divinely and supernaturally given to him so that he could minister to this woman and to her city. And it worked out pretty great. Peter and John were given a gift of faith, a gift of healing and the working of miracles. When on their way to prayer, they encountered the beggar outside the temple. Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. What an amazing thing. Peter had walked by this man many times before. This time God gave him a gift of faith to believe he could be healed, and then he healed him, and it was a miracle. Jesus gave us many prophecies, such as the Olivet Discourse, describing the future great tribulation and his second coming. In the book of Acts, Philip's daughters are called prophetesses. And there's a colorful character named Agabus who utters a few prophecies and kind of works them out using props. Peter had a vision on the rooftop that was prophetic, leading him to preach Jesus to Gentile households. We'll have a lot more to say about prophecy when we get into chapter 14, Lord willing, because there... Prophecy and the gift of tongues are prominent. After being harassed for a time by a slave girl following him for several days, Paul, quote, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And he came out that very hour. The Holy Spirit revealed to Paul that a demon was involved. Thus, he had the discernment of spirits and he was able to cast it out. Tongues and the interpretation of tongues will be thoroughly investigated when we get to chapter 14. Trust me. One thing to notice, tongues is mentioned last in this list and in the list in verse 28. Now, Paul's going to tell us that no gift is more or less important than the other. But because they were elevating tongues to the number one spot, the, the most important gift, Paul purposely, we believe, lists it last uh, not to denigrate it, but to just let them know that, hey, it, it's not as important as you think it is. Verse 11, but one in the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Three important reminders in this verse. The word works is energeo, related to our English word energy. It's a reminder that gifts are the supernatural enabling of the Holy Spirit. It is God working through you, energizing you, they are not merely an enhancement of your own abilities. These are things that you can't learn. 
And so you're not, God doesn't say, hey, there's a guy who's really articulate. I can make him a great teacher. In fact, sometimes I think uh, the better teachers are the ones that aren't quite articulate enough uh, because it doesn't depend on that. You, you, you never want it to be said of you if you're a Bible teacher that, wow, that guy is so smart, I didn't even understand what he said. That's not the goal, believe me. That will never happen here. You don't have to worry about that, at least with me here, but uh, maybe in years to come. But that's the idea. It, it's, not an, it's not an enhanced ability. The phrase distributing to each other individually as he wills is a reminder that the Holy Spirit gives you a gift or gifts as he chooses, not necessarily as you desire. You might desire a gift and God give you that gift. That, the, we're not saying that, but uh, I found a lot of young men especially desire the gift of teaching and God just doesn't give it to them. They have other gifts and they're depressed and sad because they want to do that. I think it's because we elevate that sometimes over the other gifts. Uh, it's such a public gift that we have a hard time keeping it in the mix. And the word individually alerts you that no believer is overlooked. Every Christian is gifted. The big question always is, how do I know what spiritual gift or gifts I have? I don't know. Have you ever t taken, a, 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 every now and then it rears its ugly head, there's something called a gift questionnaire. Anybody ever taken the gift questionnaire? One or two people, yeah. Um, it's a questionnaire to ask you about so that you can discover your gift. One of the questions that I really love is, do you ever find yourself speaking in an unknown tongue? <laughs> and at the end, if you do, it says you might have the gift of tongues. <laughs> Whoa, I would have never gotten that. Uh, we should ask the question differently. How do I manifest the indwelling spirit to the benefit of others? In other words, I got saved, and then if I look back from that time until now, how am I manifesting the spirit when I'm ministering to others? Is there a pattern? Does certain, something keep coming up that I am used to do all the time? And then secondly, think about some of the examples we looked at. Jesus was resting alone by a well when the Samaritan woman came to draw water. Peter and John were walking into the temple as they had done many, many times. Peter fell into a hunger trance waiting for food on a rooftop. He was a big burly fisherman. Lunch was delayed. So he went up to the roof to do whatever you do on the rooftops in those days. And he just, you know, you ever had that? The heat overcomes you and stuff. And he says he was in a trance and he gets this vision. Paul was going about his business sharing the gospel. And so looking at this, Jesus and his guys simply went about the business of being disciples. And God manifested his supernatural power through them to benefit others. Jesus at the well, resting, eyes closed, maybe even asleep, you might think. And this woman comes up and the next thing you know, he's engaged with her in a ministry. A lot of people, when they're teaching through John They'll point out that prior to him going to the well, it says, we must go through Samaria. And they say how obviously Jesus was being led by the Father, led by the Spirit to go through Samaria because he had this divine appointment he didn't even know about with the woman at the well. But these were all normal everyday activities that gave them opportunity to minister to others in the power of the Holy Spirit. Could it really be that simple? And I think the answer is yes. I think sometimes we over-intellectualize the gifts. We want all of the definitions. We want to know exactly how many there are. We argue about whether hospitality is really a gift or not, those kinds of things. And what we fail to do is just think, oh, I, I just want to minister to you. And so I'm just going to listen to you. I'm going to be available and say, God, I'm available. Whatever you want me to do, whatever you want me to say. And over time, you'll see that God uses you in the same ways over and over until it becomes recognizable that you have a gift, that you're gifted in a certain area. It's simple. Number two, the, uh, God the Holy Spirit sets you as a member that benefits others. Several B-list horror movies feature an evil, dismembered, crawling hand. One of them called Severed Ties has this tagline, horror out on a limb. Get it? Ah! Remember Thing? Its full name was Thing T. Thing. I know that from Wikipedia, which is never wrong. 
Thing is a fictional character, this is from Wikipedia, a fictional character in the Adams Family series. Thing was originally conceived as a whole creature, always seen in the background watching the family that was too horrible to be seen in person. The only part of it that was tolerable was its human hand. This can be seen in the 64 television series. The Adamses called it Thing because it was something that could not be identified. Thing was changed to a disembodied hand for the 1991 and 1993 Adams Family films. Dismembered hands in real life aren't all that functional. <laughs> that might seem obvious, but not in Corinth. By preferring certain gifts over others and by showcasing them in the public assembly, they were acting like a dismembered body. You might name them tongues, teeth, tongues. That could be their motto. Church at Corinth, tongues, tea, tongues. I'll tell you their logo in a minute too. Verse 12, I think you can guess. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so is Christ. Paul used the word body 18 times in 14 verses in this chapter, intended for you to fully grasp the awesome truth that Jesus considers us his body on the earth today. It's as if he is the head and we are his body. It's a great illustration because you already understand how your own physical body should operate. Your head directs your movements and activities so that there's a cooperation and a coordination between all of the various individual members that comprise your one body. Verse 13, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. We have to avoid thinking of water baptism every time we read the word baptized. Baptized simply means immersed. This is not water baptism. This baptism is something spiritual that occurs the moment you believe. This baptism is your immersion into the body of Jesus Christ at the moment of your conversion. You receive Jesus as your savior and you are immediately spiritually connected to every other believer by the Holy Spirit. You have the spirit, they have the spirit, Collectively, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Our individual physical and other differences, such as ethnic and cultural and social and religious and economic and gender or otherwise, no longer separate us. We are one in Christ, one body. What happens when you drink? What you are drinking goes in you to refresh and to fill you. We are talking here about the indwelling presence of God, the Holy Spirit, in every believer. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body was an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? This is Paul being funny. Ascribing consciousness to individual body parts and having them talk is humorous. Think of all the TV ads for allergy products that grab your attention because they represent you as a giant talking nose. You seen that one? It's just a big nose walking through the pharmacy looking for Alarest or something. In Corinth, they were a giant in unintelligible tongue. That was their logo. They hope they didn't spend much on it, but imagine, just imagine in your mind, just for a minute, a giant unintelligible tongue with legs. That's the church at Corinth. Verse 18, but now God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the hand to the feet, I have no need of you. In the general sense that your physical body is fearfully and wonderfully made and all functions together, there are no superior parts. In a similar way, we should never think certain gifts of the Holy Spirit are superior to others. Don't come up afterwards and ask me about the appendix. I don't know what it does. Science doesn't know what it does. It may not be necessary, but we're talking in general terms. Your body is fearfully and wonderfully made. Everything kind of works together. You find that out whenever you injure yourself, how your whole body works together. No much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Ever kick a bedpost barefoot? All of a sudden, life is about your feet. I'm tempted to wear shoes at night when I go to bed because of that. it's a fear that I have. Man, does that hurt. 
Verse 23, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on those we bestow greater honor, and on our unpresentable parts, greater modesty. We normally clothe parts of our bodies that we consider unpresentable and polite company. By doing so, we show a kind of honor to those unpresentable parts. So Paul's just trying to establish the same idea that, that the body is all necessary and it all functions together. But our presentable parts have no need, but God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part uh, which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it, or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. With regard to the body of believers, we are to understand that God bestows honor on members whose giftings we might think less honorable. Emphasizing certain gifts as more honorable, or we would say more spiritual, will cause schism among God's people, a division. Instead, we ought to care for one another equally as members of the earthly body of Jesus Christ. All gifts and giftings are equally spiritual. Let me ask you this. If you want to cut a two by four, would you rather use a circular saw or hedge clippers? Well, I use hedge clippers, but I don't have any really good tools. Some of you guys, and I don't begrudge you this, I'm happy for you because you like doing stuff which I don't, but you have just the right tool for the job. And I've learned over the years, if you have the right tool, even a moron like me can usually stumble through it. But I'm, uh, we we're joking about this in the back and, and it's like, hey, why would you need a chisel when you already have a Phillips screwdriver? You know? How many of you have done that and broken the handle on your screwdriver because you're using it as a chisel? Actually, it'd be a flathead screwdriver, that's how stupid I am, but anyway. <laughs> The best tool is the one that will do the job. And that's the same with gifts of the Spirit. Your speaking in tongues would not be an appropriate or best gift if a person needs a healing, for example. So if I go to visit you in the hospital and you're going to die, uh, you know, probably having the gift of hospitality and saying, well, can I get you a hamburger? Or I say, well, let me just pray in tongues right now. How about you exercise the gift of healing or find somebody who can, you know, that kind of a thing. The best gift is the one you need at the time. Those listening in Corinth would have understood this as a reproof because they did prefer certain gifts as more spiritual, notably speaking in tongues. It was at the top of their lists, but purposefully on the bottom of Paul's. Again, not because it was less important than other gifts, but that it was equally important and need not be elevated. Verse 27, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. We are one body, and each individual member has his or her giftings to benefit others. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Gifted men establish the church, men like the apostles and the prophets. A gifted man or men equipped and go on equipping the church, men who are teachers, Gifts are given to all in order to manifest the Holy Spirit in the life of the church and to build it up. We gave an example for miracles and for gifts of healings. Let me just add this. No one who is used this way can exercise a healing or a miracle anytime they want. It seems often that the gift of faith, healing, and miracles go together like they did with Peter and John at the temple and the healing of that man. But that didn't always happen with Peter and John. They had walked by that guy many times. In fact, Jesus had walked by that guy many times without healing him. And so what we're looking at when we talk about healing is somebody who is sometimes used to know when God wants to heal someone, and they are given a gift of faith for that moment and the gift of healing and the gift of miracles. They seem to work together. Otherwise, if somebody says, hey, I have the gift of healing, Drive him down to the hospital and just go room by room and empty that place out. Wouldn't, if you could heal anybody at any time because you had the gift of healing, isn't, isn't that what you would do? You'd go from hospital to hospital for the rest of your life, raising people up off of their sickbed. On a practical level, that is not the way the gift works. You see it in the Bible. You see it in the life of the church. It's not a matter of the fact that people don't have enough faith they're not given the gift of faith at that moment to be healed. And so bear that in mind. Teaching is not a natural ability. It's a gift so that those hearing it have a sense that God is speaking through it 
to them. Some sort of supernatural transaction takes place where God speaks to you between the soul and the spirit and you're ministered to. So it's not something that can be learned or honed in. You either have it or you don't. Sometimes people will come up after a teaching and they'll say, you know that, te- uh, you know, here I'm in 1 Corinthians 12, they'll say, you know that teaching you did today on Joshua was so rich. So um, I got so much out of Caleb. And, um, and I, I just let it go. I said, hey, praise the Lord. Because somehow the Holy Spirit was talking to them. And I'm thinking, Lord, I prepared all week for 1 Corinthians and this guy's listening to something about Caleb, but it got ministered to because there was a divine transaction. That's an exaggeration, but that's the idea. And so uh, it either works or it doesn't. In the Old Testament, Joshua had the gift of helps, for example, as he ministered to Moses. He was there besides Moses, and it says of him, Joshua did as Moses said unto him. Administrations is tough. The word only appears here in all the New Testament. Defined, it means the steering of a ship with skill by a pilot. It has to do with governing the church in what we would call vision, But again, since it's a gift, we should not be confusing it with any kind of worldly success and leadership. We don't want worldly leadership techniques uh, and opinions to come into the church because the church is spiritual. Verse 29, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? What is the emphatic answer to all of those questions? This is your participation time now. What is the emphatic answer to all of those questions? All right, no. Thus we can confidently declare, do all do not speak with tongues. So Paul is careful. He kind of, in a way, gets them into it. Of course they would say not everyone's an apostle or a prophet or a teacher or a healer. And he says, yeah, and not everybody speaks with tongues because they thought that they did. In some fellowships, even today, you're told all people can speak in tums, uh, tums. Uh, some people take tums for their stomach, but you're told that all people can speak in tongues and you should seek it. In other fellowships, you're told it is the outward sign that you've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So they'll tell you, yeah, you're saved, but you're not really baptized with the Spirit until you speak in tongues. And in some fellowships, they tell you it's the sign you've been saved. That if you're not speaking in tongues, you're not even a Christian. But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Wait a minute. I thought Paul said that all gifts are equal and necessary. Well, he did. And so that gives us a key to what he actually means here. The believers in Corinth thought speaking in tongues a superior gift. By their assessment and argument, they were earnestly desiring the best gifts. So if somebody came to them and said, hey, why are you guys all speaking in tongues at the same time? They would say, it's the best gift. We desire to have the best gift, and and it's tongues, uh, for whatever reason that they thought that. The groups that elevate tongues today are making this same claim, and they are making this same error. I don't know how many people I've talked to whenever I talk about this subject They come up and say, you know, you're right. I went to a church, you know, when I was little or younger or back in the day. And um, they told us that everybody had to speak in tongues. And then if you didn't speak in tongues, you had to come forward and they'd lay hands on you and pray for you. And if you still didn't speak in tongues after all of that, they would give you a word or a phrase to say in order to help you loose your tongue so that you would start speaking in tongues. That's why we always joke here about the term, she rode a Honda. If you say it over and over again pretty fast, she rode a Honda, she rode a Honda, she rode a Honda, she rode a Honda. And then you're speaking in tongues as far as these people are concerned. And uh, it's sad because Paul says right here, do all speak? I mean, they don't have people come forward and say, We're gonna, you have to have the gift of healings, otherwise you're not a Christian. But in that same list, he says... If you speak in tongues, not everybody's going to do that. And then they argue, well, well, it's such an important gift that, you know, everybody should have it, or, or he's only talking about public speaking, that we should all speak in tongues in our private life. Uh, it's a dodge. Uh, it's a mistake. They and we ought to take a more excellent approach, and that is to desire only to benefit others, and that will be guided by selfless love to be described in chapter 13. The church was given the gift of the Holy Spirit, His indwelling, his empowering us to serve the Lord. He then gives each of us gifts as he sees fit 
to manifest himself to others. And as we do that, the many members build up the one body. Instead of focusing on the gifts and how to find yours, gather together in the assembly of God and listen for the Holy Spirit to direct you. Go out into the world and listen for the Holy Spirit to direct you. The way or the ways you find yourself being used over time reveal your gifting. You'll find yourself ministering to people in a similar fashion over and over again. And then you can say, hey, maybe I've got the gift of whatever it is. And so uh, don't desire the best gifts. There are no best gifts. Just be a person who wants to serve the Lord. And when we get to chapter 13, Lord willing, it sets the stage. I know we take chapter 13 out of its uh, place between 12 and 14 and use it at weddings and all kinds of things like that because it talks about what love is and what love isn't. But in context, Paul is saying, hey, you, if you are this kind of person, letting the love of God flow through you, you will minister to people. and You won't be worried about what gifts you have. You'll just be using them on a daily basis. Thank you.